All right. Well, I see all the faces that uh, we need to have. And I know that we're short on time today because we've got the other session at 5 p.m. So I would say we just get right into it. Uh, Chase, sure. turn it over. So afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. And uh, thanks for uh, letting me be a couple minutes late. So we are short on time, but we do want to use tonight to kind of game plan for really the work session at the end of the month, which is also a broader plan about how we envision community engagement over the summer. And um, the work session is scheduled for a, a kind of a short summary of the FMP 1.0 work as we flip to 2.0. And so Dwayne's going to start and kind of outline um, what that might look like at the end of the month. And then we'd like to just have a discussion, share some of our ideas and vision of how community engagement can go, get your all's feedback, and then start preparing documents for how we might roll that out to the, to the board as a whole at the work session at the end of April. Um, we'll try to give as much information as we can, but also be conscious of the time that we do need to keep it um, under an hour tonight. So um, with that, unless there's any questions that we start, I will turn over to Dwayne to just give that preview of the summary that we, we're gonna share at the end of the month. Thanks, Chase. Uh, I just have a rough draft that I'm kind of reading from, not really ready to share it with y'all, but I'll, I'll just go through it. We thought, we thought it would be important to kind of build what we're calling the foundation for Facility Master Plan 2.0. What better foundation than what we've accomplished already in Facility Master Plan 1.0. So putting together a summary of some of the accomplishments of that, you know, not only the dollars spent, but the, the projects that we've done, the types of projects we've done, you know, both new renovation additions and all the things we've done. And basically, if you take the Pebble projects we did, you take the SAVE projects we did, the uh, Pebble life cycle, in addition to spending regular Pebble dollars, and the general obli obligation bond, we easily reached $400 million in projects over the past eight years, which I know it sounds like it's, I think it's pretty good accomplishment. I think we can all agree with that translates to about $4 million per month over that eight year period. So that's that in itself, uh, you know, we basically ran a small construction business out of the facility management office. Uh, and I think we can all be proud of that. Am I, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. You're all right? Okay. I want to make sure because I got an unstable connection. I'll switch to my Wi Fi hotspot if I need to. But anyway, so produce the capacity of the district. We reduce the reliance on modular buildings. Uh, we, uh, we finished the projects three years early, maybe four on some, uh, but that, that in itself allowed the district to increase the scope of the projects that we've done. We've done more than we thought we could have probably done in the beginning. We, we uh, offset inflation by that many years. That's quite the accomplishment. But I think probably the most important part is that we have created 21st century classrooms with 21st century standards. You know, a lot of our buildings, and you go back 100 years, take the long fellows, take the mans. You know, they were boilers, and they had no air conditioning, and they didn't have the modern so we've put Break in on doing a little in, bit in these buildings so we have created uh, buildings with classrooms that are more conducive for more energy efficient yeah uh, we've got great insulation we've breaking up is this real quick you still with me there. Can you hear me? Yeah, no? we got you now. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. I got switched over. Okay. So just, I'll just finish tooting my horn a little bit here, but you know, we, we put in ventilation systems that exchange the air in our classrooms multiple times per hour. We've put in LED LED lighting, we've done daylight harvesting, which means that we dim lights if we have too much sunlight. We increase it when we don't. 
We put occupancy controls in. We've done. We've we've made our buildings more vibrant with bright colors that stimulate learning. You know, we've done we've done our modern fire code improvements with smoke, heat, and sprinkler systems. Uh, we've put in thermal efficient windows and doors. We've improved the acoustics. We've put in new furniture, casework. Technologies have been a huge piece. You know, the interactive learning, teaching tools, the connectivity, the inclusion of special education needs. Uh, and then our buildings in general with our security systems and the multiple layers of protection, as Jeff and I like to call the onion of the security. There's a lot of layers to that. Uh, we've improved storm shelters. We've added storm shelters. We've made buildings safer. We've added gyms, playgrounds, inclusive playgrounds, athletic venues. We've made our buildings ADA accessible. We've upgraded art and music facilities. We've improved career tech, multi-purpose multi classrooms like lead the way. We've done student commons, lunchrooms, kitchens, nursing stations, and private conference rooms. With that, I'll, I'll slow down. But the point is, I think we've built a pretty good foundation to kind of say, okay, folks, you know, here's what here's what we've done, but we got it, we can do better. There are pieces that we need to finish. There are, and we've identified those in the early talk of facility master plan 2.0. But how do we now take this to the next level? How do we put this portrait of a graduate into this? And how do we make our classrooms and our buildings even more friendly and better for education? So I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Right? But uh, hopefully you agree that we've started what I'm calling the foundation for success in 2.0. Did I get that covered, Chase? Hopefully you were able to hear me. I mean, yeah, you kind of came in and out a little bit, Dwayne, but um, I think for the most part, I think what um, Dwayne said at the end is really where we want him to spend a lot of time when he goes over at the work session and actually when we do it in community engagement, because to get clear, get that message out that it's trying to set that foundation, as Dwayne said, for the next layer, we're not as interested unless the board, it, I'm kind of probably need some clarity from you all and then maybe from the board, what kind of recap you're looking for on FMP 1.0. Like, I mean, we've had a lot of updates. And so I don't think that we think it's a good use of time to, you know, have Dwayne go year by year about what the projects more. Okay. I see Janet shaking your head. So I'm glad to see that more of kind of this global, global overview to give a sense of where we were and where we've come and then how we're going to use that as a launching pad to, to move forward. Um, but if there's anything specific, that you all want Dwayne to cover. We, we definitely wanna make sure that we do that, but we just don't want to spend, I mean, quite honestly, and I mean, Dwayne could talk for over an hour if we really wanted to give a true summary of all the work that's gone on over the last decade um, because of, yes, you can. And that's not a criticism. I mean, that's a compliment to the, the in-depth yeah. nature of the, of the work that we've done, right? But we just don't think that's where we are right now. Um, but any questions or, or feedback or things you want to make sure Dwayne does cover in that summary? Dwayne just covered was right on one, just the, the scale of what's been accomplished uh, in terms of the dollars spent, the number of projects, the number of buildings that were impacted. I think my internet is probably crappy too. Can you hear me? Uh, I, just got a me I just got a message that my internet's unstable. But, um, and then the highlights. The, the, the um, accessible buildings, the HVAC, the sustainable heating methods. It's, I mean, all the things that you just highlighted, you know, the benefits, Duane. Um, I think, you know, the, the types of buildings, art, music, uh, playgrounds, I mean, all those things I think are really important to cover. But I, but I think it's, it's that foundation and, and re reaffirming the confidence that we have in our ability to execute on these kinds of facilities plans. We've done it, we, we've, we've demonstrated, we have the ability to manage that scale of operation. And I think that's a really important thing to note for the community as well. So I, I think you nailed it, Dwayne. I just wanna say thanks and um, I think that's the kind of summary. I, I also wonder if there's a couple projects that you could highlight, Dwayne, that came directly from like a community feedback session to say we heard from the community that XYZ was really important. And so in response to that, we did this project um, to, to kind of highlight that we do also take seriously community feedback and input in, in deciding how we move forward. And that we, so we say we intend to do that again, we can, we can back up some of that 
promise with, with how we did it before. And I would say, uh, uh, I would suspect that one of the things that community said they wanted, and particularly the staff said they wanted, was built for what uh, was buildings that are air conditioned so they can, uh, students can attend uh, comfortably in the uh, spring and uh, uh, fall. Uh, I also, from my perspective, uh, I'm not terribly interested in the money we spent. I think Lisa's, uh, I agree with Lisa, I'm really terribly interested in our fulfilling our uh, educational uh, needs with, all, with the building and improvements you've done. Especially, I agree, emphasizing special education things, playgrounds, inclusive playgrounds, um, and, and the, the other uh, building we've done that have expanded our, uh, um, that have expanded our capacity to meet the needs of all students in the district. I hope, uh, I don't know if there's any way to say this, but since we're continuing physical improvement, I hope there's some way to indicating that we're not redoing anything we've just done in the last 10 years. We may be building upon some specific uh, aspects of a building, uh, but we're not, we're not, we're not correcting any mistakes we made in the first uh, FMV. Well, I would, I would agree with you to a point, Charlie. There is, there is money that's been set aside in the facility master plan for future HVAC upgrades because we do have mechanical systems that will wear out and will need to be upgraded and replaced. They're not a mistake. It's just a fact, you know, the, the buildings wore out. So there is some of that. But Having said that, I, you know, a couple of things when I first got here, the big the big push from the community was a new high school, you know, and we did that. And I think the, the way we did it, we did it with, with staff. We took high school staff and community members and students and created a huge group of people that had input into that Liberty High School. It, it was a classic example of how to use community input on a, a particular building. So that's, that's a good one. Everybody knows where it's at. It's, you know, a lot of good pictures you can highlight so that might be one um, the other one that we had a lot of community input, if it just comes to mind was our playgrounds oh my you know <laughs> the input we had on that janet you'll never forget i'm sure i won't but it, but it was just you know a lot of input and we have done a good job in responding to that and putting together you know the appropriate playground types of equipment and you know the, the and the, the surfaces all that goes with that so i think that's a huge part but I'm sure we can come up with one or two more where we have good community input. Uh, but I, I would like to emphasize Liberty Eye, how much input we got from teachers and administrators and students and community people in general. I mean, it was, it was a really good example of how to do it right. Charlie noted um, on kind on of Monday. the- on noted <laughs> Oh, noted the instructional a impact. Lot on time on bus. Yeah. Yeah, we've done that too. Yeah. <laughs> well, side note, right? No, it, it, it's. I'm. Sorry, I think my internet's crummy, but instructional impact, yes. Um, the 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 standards, Dwayne, that you put into the you know, standards of the different type of rooms. That's that gets. I think at instructional impact that music rooms, art rooms, are, are built to a certain standard, right? Right. Um, but on time, on budget, and our internal capacity to manage all of the bids that you had to manage, oversight of all of the contractors. I mean, for me, that that raises a high degree of confidence that we've got the internal capacity to run large projects. We don't have to talk about the money, perhaps, if that is not what we want to focus on, which I understand. But the capacity to kind of work for me just suggests and we do it on time on budget with community impact with instructional improvements um i mean that just demonstrates we know what we're doing we know how to do this kind of work and and should help people feel confident good stewards of these dollars to drive the charlie touched on a couple things that were instructional related and i i think Dwayne also kind of went started to go there but um, kind of maybe two side benefits of the plan is, is by putting in efficient systems, um, we not only made our, our uh, physical plant operations greener 
and less of a carbon uh, footprint. So we started on that initiative that the board is, is very interested in. But what that did was, is that reduced stress on the general fund and provided more resources for the instructional program. So we essentially supported the instructional programs. And the other thing with some of the HVAC work that was done in that, we had no idea how important that HVAC work would be done uh, with a pandemic that's we're now amongst us. Uh, so much of the ESSER funds can be used to improve air quality and all of our buildings already exceed that because of the work that we've been doing. So, um, you know, we could say we were ahead of the curve, but I don't know if that's really the way we want to brag that one up, but we certainly put, uh, made our facilities such that they're better and healthier for our students as well. Okay. So, Thank you for that feedback and we'll try to incorporate some of it and tighten that up a little bit. And I know because work sessions after board meeting and so we know that we'll have already been there a while and, and there's we want to make sure that we can kind of be uh, efficient with our time on that. Um, so after we do that part, we want to turn to maybe what community, not maybe, but hopefully what community engagement will look like this summer. And Charlie, I want to go back to what you say. I really appreciate uh, what you said about hopefully FMP 2.0 isn't fixing things or correcting things that were supposed to be done in 1.0 because that was kind of our mindset when we started looking at how might community engagement look this time around. And we know people are creatures of habit. And so they're going to want to go back to something that was familiar. Well, for those that might remember 10 years ago, what we did was we did a building assessment, right? Like we had BLDD come in and they said, what are the hot zones? What are things that need to be worked on? What are the problems? Well, we feel like that will could come across as a negative because we just went through an FMP 1.0. And so, Charlie, to the point you're making, if we go through a building by building and say these are the these are the improvements that need to be made, we're kind of taking shots at ourselves about the the work that's been done. And so, we felt like there needed to be a different approach. We also um, took very seriously, Janet, you've been a, a big champion for this, and others on the board about. FMP 2.0 flowing out a portrait of a graduate and this idea that it needs to flow from what we want to do instructionally. So we thought, okay, we think there's a way that maybe we can pattern what we're doing with FMP um, engagement kind of similarly to portrait of a graduate. So as we go to the back to the community in the fall, the two will dovetail nicely together as we go back out and, and ask for things for um, the, the community to support. So stay with me here. I'm going to show you a couple of things and we're going to kind of try to walk through um, where, where we want to end up. And um, Kim, I can share my screen. Okay. So this is an example of, it's not ours. Um, and um, quite honestly, Kristen will do a much better job. But this is a portrait of a graduate profile from a, a district, I think, in, in Texas. And um, Lisa's very familiar with this because she's been in the process. And Janet and Charlie, I know you have some understanding, but right, this is their portrait of a graduate um, blueprint. And their competencies are those six uh, keywords, learner's mindset, collaboration, communication, and so on. And then after each, under each one of those, right, they have what those elements mean. Well, the process that they utilize to get there is they bring the community together. And I'm going to switch documents here and let me know if this switched. Is what Portrait of a Graduate does is they provide a, a large list of different competencies, right? Um, this is just a, a, a snapshot of them adaptability, confidence, courageous. And then through funneling of the community engagement process, this Texas group came up with there are six key ones, right? We think that while we don't obviously want to use the competencies that they use for portrait of a graduate, because they're so much different, we can build a similar framework and utilize Qualtrics to do something similar. Rather than just putting up a laundry list of different projects or even that list that uh, Dwayne shared in, in the winter, we think that if we can build it based on the different attributes or different uh, priorities that the community has around concepts, we can then build the projects underneath it. And so rather than using those competency lists, we would do something that maybe looks like, and I apologize, like Dwayne and then our team and then the board, don't take these for gossip, gospel. They're just examples of the work we'd have to do over the next couple of months. We would come up with a list of attributes 
and then define them. Things that we know impact the instructional zone, but are something that go into the building of buildings. So like if flexible or multi-purpose spaces are important to the district or is building functionality, accessibility, right? We talked about, um, we talked about our playgrounds, uh, STEAM or STEM, climate action. Um, and then we would build out a list of 20, 30, 40 of these characteristics. And then here's some more, we keep generating a list, early childhood, right? We're gonna have that conversation later on. We know about technology, CTE, outdoor spaces, the list goes on and on. We would define these and just like they use these attributes to come to bring the community together around Port River graduate to figure out what those guiding principles are, we could do the same thing around what's important and what we believe as a community should drive what we're doing with FMP 2.0. And then we can go back and we can take those, and this is just kind of a, a mock-up, like they've done in the portrait of a graduate, right? We could list our attributes with their description and then align our projects that, un, that, that, that align with those attributes that the community has given us under each one of those. And so um, if climate action is one of those important pieces, all of our projects that have an impact on reducing greenhouse emissions or reducing our carbon footprint or using re uh, renewable resources, we could then nest under that as one of our attributes. Now, I don't know what the attributes are because the red pieces are where we would engage our stakeholders uh, to see what those are. We can package it a lot like the portrait of a graduate because it would somewhat flow from those. Again, it would look the same. So when we go out to the community in the fall for the second round of community engagement, they would understand that those two are connected. Um, overlaying the top of this, and this is work the board also has to do, is remember we talked about the board establishing those guiding principles. Um, we've had some discussion about where we think the board is on these, equity being one of those, safety and security being one of those, but we don't want to presuppose that's where the board would be. So the board would need to have that conversation. So everything would be under that, that general envelope. So we wouldn't have an attribute that says equity because equity, safety and security need to flow through all of those pieces underneath. It's a different way to, to look at it a little bit, but because we're at the spot we are, we feel like if the community gives us feedback on the different pieces it should be important in that thinking, we can then start developing that, that plan, frame it around these important facility attribute descriptions that the community gives us, and then come back out with that plan um, later in the summer. It's a lot of information, there's a lot more, but I'll kind of pause right there to make sure people are get, get, kind of picking up on what we're thinking about maybe an approach we could take, and then we can talk more about how the sessions might look. So, I know that our last session of Portrait of a Graduate, we did a, a lot of this type of attribute work that you're talking about. So it makes sense to me. I'm, I'm not sure where John, Janet and Charlie are because you guys didn't have the opportunity to do that. But my question is, you know, we started Portrait of a Graduate with what, 35 attributes. And then in all of our small groups, we whittled it down to seven. Are we gonna carry those seven over to this work? Do you envision us starting from scratch? Do you say, these are the seven that we've identified through portrait of a graduate. Do you want to add to this list? I mean, how do you see the inner- So that's a good question, Lisa. And so I, I, I gave all the examples to portrait of a graduate because I know that people like to use processes that they're familiar with, right? And with our community going through portrait of a graduate, that would be something that they're now familiar with. We would use completely different attributes. And that's what we would need because the attributes of portrait of a graduate are competencies about what we want students to know when they leave our schools. What we're looking for from the community are attributes that they want in our buildings as they support learning. And so it would be conceptually the same thing, but it would be this list that we would generate um, probably internally. Uh, and, and, you know, Dwayne is already researching. Um, some of the things that architects and other builders put out when they design new schools and how they enhance learning for the for the descriptors but no it would be a it would be a separate list because we're looking for different things it's just more lisa to that concept about how we would gather the input and how we would try to streamline it into providing the support for the work that we're doing and it goes back to what i can't remember if it was charlie or janet that asked wayne is 
can you highlight a couple of projects that came right from community engagement or what was important? Well, you know, if accessibility is important, right, that will be one of the attributes. And then the, the projects, how we design them would start to fall under that. Now, we'll be honest, like the exhaustive list that Dwayne has put together, we believe that the most of those projects will fall under what our community wants because how we continue to engage our community. But we've also had the conversation of, look, if they don't, we might have to pivot this summer and come up with some different projects that do align with what the community wants. And so we can't be so caught in because we thought one thing, if our community comes back and says they want something different, we need to be able to pivot and do some of that as well. That makes sense to me, Chase. Um, thanks for describing a bit more the attribute thing. I, so there's, but I'm, what's going through my head, and again, I'm not familiar really with the methodology on the attributes from Portrait of a Graduate, but I am wondering if there's some connectivity that we'd need to sort of, you know, draw to. Like, I wouldn't imagine that the facilities attributes would be completely disconnected from the attributes that are coming, uh, uh, being developed as part of the portrait of a graduate. So somehow directionally showing how they're shaping the facilities attributes, I feel like it's not one-to-one, -one, but they should all be of a piece, it feels like. I agree. And I think the timeline that we have for when we start community engagement on this will allow us to do that, Janet. I mean, I think that's part of the conversation because in addition to that bridge from FMP 1.0 to 2.0, we're gonna even incorporate the work that the board's been doing on Portrait of a Graduate and how we see this as phased and how that more instructional lens rather than building improvement is going to drive the next round of facility upgrades that, that we do across the district. So yes, and, and we would, and we would try to theme it together, right? We know, we all know that if you have documents that look alike, even if they're about different topics, people are going to think they're connected because they're on the same backdrop. They have the same logo, they have the same. And so we would we would wanna carry that through, which is where Kristen can be a huge benefit for us on that piece. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm uh, rather enamored of this, of this approach right now. Um, and I did have a chance to look through some of the information I think Matt gave us about the second session of Portrait for a Graduate. So I was a graduate, so I have some idea about how you got to the uh, the list of attributes and that work that have, uh, you've gotten, that have gotten so far, or a list of things that students, people look for students to be able to do. Um, in terms of things that we may have to, things that we're not necessarily explicitly planning for now, that may come out as a part of this uh, community engagement. Things that strike me immediately are magnet schools, uh, changing uh, middle school or where kids go in the sixth through eighth grades. Um, and th those are things you know that are that are uh, we've heard a community discussion about, and I don't think we have a specific or a, a very identifiable way to get at those possibilities in FMP 2.0, at least as I've seen it so far. I'm not saying we need to do that now, but I'm, th I'm thinking that that may be something that'll, that uh, um, we may need to, uh, to grapple with uh, later on. So Charlie, those are both really good examples of, of I think, feedback that we need from, from you and we're gonna ask others is because we could develop, and I, I'd, I'd wanna work with Amy and Diane and Nick uh, on the CNI side, but like we could work to develop a attribute that we could add to the list for the community to consider about whether it's about transitions between grade levels or, you know, or Matt, what would we say about middle school? Like a middle school, I don't know if we want to be as explicit about a middle school model, but that is something that we could add to that list. So then when we go out and engage the community, they can provide us feedback about where they prioritize that in what they want to look at. So, I mean, that is something that we can definitely include. And then it's really up to the feedback we get from the community about whether or not we need to adjust what we're doing in our facility plan um, because of that feedback. Now, also, I'm not as naive to think that just because we have four sessions and we get an overwhelming support for changing to a middle school model that we're all of a sudden going to change what we're doing to go to the middle school, right? The board would have to have some much more in-depth conversation about that. And we'd probably have to do additional community engagement, but it's, it's, that's one of the, I think the beauties of this approach 
is that we can start to garner where the community is about the type of schools they want to see us rather than just a debate of whether or not this school should get four more classrooms or we should build another athletic complex here, right? We try to take those specific projects out of the discussion to see from um, more of analysis of what we want to drive how our buildings look. And I, I didn't say early childhood education, which I was certainly- It's on there. Oh, we, we, we know it's on there. Yeah, that one, I just, that one we'll, we'll have on there for sure. Well, and some of them are linked together, right? I mean, that's the hard thing. Like if you do, depending on how you strategize early childhood, uh, whether it's at our current attendance centers, or if you look at um, different kind of sites for that, that could impact how you're able to solve the upper elementary, then grade levels or the middle school concept too. So, you know, bringing all those together in a sense, like Chase said, I think taking that holistic view about how do you want your schools to look and feel, you know, really informs it rather than you know, a music room here or an art room there uh, type of conversation. You know, this is, we talked about a couple of different concepts and this is the one that we kind of ended up gravitating towards, but if there are others, other approaches that you want us to consider, we're happy to, to look at that. Um, so please, but I'm going to turn the page a little bit, but I don't want to, to lose that or think that we're closed off to if you want us to take a different approach, but kind of talking about the sessions themselves. Um, we think that we, we want to use Qualtrics a, a lot because um, everybody can't get to the session, but we feel like we can still get that input. And that's another thing that this approach allows us to do is we're not asking somebody to tell us if they're in favor of more music rooms or if they want a four room addition at this building. We're just trying to tell, ask them to give us their, their impressions of what should be important to us conceptually when we build schools. And you, while you'll get more information and an, an opportunity to collaborate with other people in the community if you come to the session, if we give them a document that, that looks like, um, th that share? Um, this one, right, with these, dip, they call them competencies, we're not gonna call them that, but a document that defines these different attributes and give them some direction about what we're looking for from the community, somebody can provide us very meaningful feedback because they can let us know what's important to schools in their community. And so we find it's a way that we're gonna be able to uh, potentially engage more people in a way that we haven't in the past. Um, the difference with Portrait of a Graduate, as, as Lisa talked about, is that you know, Portrait of a Graduate is four sessions over the course of four months. We're not looking to engage one group of people over a four week period. We think that we could do this in a slimmed down fashion enough that we could probably do it in a 90 minute session and then offer that 90 minute to 120 minute session two, three or four times over the course of the summer and invite different groups of people. And so that we try to get as many people to, to come um, as possible. We're not comfortable with doing it in person. I mean, I guess if the board really pushed it to us, we could have more conversation, but um, we're, we're not excited right now about bringing a hundred people together to do this work in, in small groups. We feel like that if we have the, the virtual platform to do, um, we, should, we should try to utilize that for health and safety purposes at this point. So Chase, uh, how are we doing with getting input so far in Portrait of a Graduate from, uh, uh, from different, uh, different groups? Uh, Asian Americans, Black, Latinx, Sudanese um, community, you know, sure. the big groups out there that we're, you know, we, we need to try to bring in. And I'll, Matt, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think the, the big thing is going to be trying to so if I'm understanding your question, Charlie, it's more not about what's happening during portrait of graduate, but what happens after portrait of graduate. Do I understand that right? About getting that input? Well, I'm, well actually I was thinking about how input <clears throat> during the process of developing the out outcomes of portrait for a group of, of uh, portrait of a graduate. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And that's where I, I thought you were kind of trending your thinking. So we get the competencies or we get like our outputs of that, you know, however you want to refer to those, those skills and attributes. And then I think 
obviously, as we're talking about facility planning here, that's where a lot of planning in the district starts too, right? And where we still probably have to bring voices to the table to say, well, this was identified as a portrait attribute. Now, how do we go about getting that, right? Well, we're talking about how we go about helping facilitate that through our buildings, you know, in this meeting, but there's going to be other times we need to get together to say, well, if this is really important for our students, you know, how are we going to engage in a conversation or how this can happen for all kids? And so I think taking those attributes probably to some of those different groups is going to be important and letting them weigh in on those yeah. things. And, um, but I think also probably bring in some intentional groups together that, you know, if we want to do a middle school concept, you know, maybe the easiest part of that's going to be the building part of it, the rest, you know, the curriculum instruction component, and how that's going to look different and how uh, kids are going to operate in a middle school versus a junior high differently. Those are going to be longer term conversations for us too. So I think being very intentional about trying to go to those groups is going to be an important aspect, but then also thinking about how do we bring people together and have conversations around if we want to accomplish these goals for our kids, um, what's our avenue to do that and what's, what are going to be the programming efforts that come out of that. So I don't know if I'm answering that the way you necessarily no, thought, but those are kind of the two ways I see it, Charlie. Yeah. I think being intentional is, you know, in, uh, uh, in trying to bring people in. <clears throat> Yeah, is um, is probably our most effective way of trying to do this. Right? But, but the intentionality, I think, I, I think we've learned something about how, how to contact groups over the last uh, few years. Anyway, that we didn't know before. Yeah, so I, I mean, if we're lever I agree with Charlie. If we're leveraging Qualtrics. We should have some sense, right, of the families who respond to those kinds of surveys and just making sure that it's not disproportionately you know, white families or you, you see, what I'm saying? I think that, I think that's where you're going, Charlie, right? Making yeah, sure right, you're yeah. intentional of getting all these different voices right. into the process. Right. And we can do that, can't we, Kristen? I mean, because we have demographic, demographic information data from behind, the, yeah. behind the scenes, actually. So we didn't have to ask some of those questions, right? Kristen, mm -hmm. we can just, we, we already have it available. Yeah. And yeah, that's correct. I think it'd just be a good check to make sure that Qualtrics is, you know, fairly representing the populations in our district. And if it is, that's fantastic. It's a great tool. If we're seeing that mm -hmm. it's, you know, disproportionate in some areas, and we have to again be intentional around how to go get that feedback uh, and input in the process. Right. So the other piece of this, and I talked about a little bit, is really the the board work around the guiding principles. I mean, I, I think that. Um, along with, you know, Jan, you talked about it being connected to portrait of a graduate. That's the other piece we want to make sure it's connected to is what are the guiding principles for the board. And we're happy to support that conversation in, in any way we can. But really, that's, you know, something where, where we're going to take our cues for what those attributes look like, some of them, you know, kind of based on that. And as I said, like I intentionally don't didn't give one of the example attributes of equity because listening to the board's conversations, I know that priority. And so I know that, that I don't want to say I'm 100% sure, but I'm 99% sure that equity is going to be one of the board's guiding principles. Um, and that'd be the other piece that um, for, for you all as this committee, that's critically important, we believe, to get accomplished before we go out to community engagement so we can tell that story to the community that these are the board's guiding principles. So as people try to go beyond those rails, we can bring them back in and say, no, 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 the board has already set, you know, somewhat of a parameter for us and we are going to operate within this, you know, some of our non-negotiables um, that we think are important. And um, we can talk more about that. I think, uh, Kristen, we looked, isn't that slated for early June with the board? Yeah. Is that right? And so determining those like, principles was June, yes. That would be kind of the last session. thing that the board would do before we went out to community engagement would be to identify um, publicly those those guiding principles. Can you give us a time to say, you got to get ready to talk, have this conversation here. So start thinking about it. So Charlie, that's kind of what, yes. And um, um, I'm going to do that in as a respectable way as possible at the work session at the end of the month. So maybe I'll let Lisa do it because right, she's your board colleague. So she can, she can say that part. It doesn't need to be super respectful. We just need to be <laughs> and direct and give everyone a head stop. Well, and so that's what it will be, right? That when we get to the work session, we'll say, you know, this is our idea, but for this to work, this is what we need to do. We need to, we need to build up these attributes. The board needs to, to identify their guiding principles. We need to finish Portrait of a Graduate. And that all is gonna happen in the six weeks between, or the eight weeks between 
the board work session in in, um, in April and when community engagement starts at the end of June. And so Charlie, yes, we can give those checkpoints and reiterate that and kind of that schedule we shared with the board back in February maybe. Um, but yeah, we can definitely give those markers. So do you see Lisa, this committee kind of taking a stab at a straw person of guiding principles, like some, you know, and just maybe here's 15 things we considered, here's the top four that we think make most sense and then take that to a work session of the full board. I mean, how do you see that playing out? I think, I think we should ask the full board that and, and maybe that's something that we can bring up in the work session and, and see what, how, how would the full board, because I don't want us, right, to do a lot of work and then have the full board say, no, we want to do this as the seven of us. Um, yeah. But yeah. they also might, you know, efficiencies and, and where everyone's at. But I, I think we should address that with the full board and say, what, what do you want to see? Do you want to start from a blank slate as a board in a work session and do guiding principles together, the seven of us? Or would you like the operations committee, specifically me, Janet, and Charlie, to put together what the three of us, and, and I have to say, I think the three of us are pretty diverse represented, representation of, of the seven, um, but, but then take the cue from the full board yeah, and, and then move forward how they want. Because I think this could really be a meaty set of discussions, actually. And well, um, the I, equity one's easy yeah. to face. I agree with you. I think that one is probably going to be at the top, but it's everything. I mean, I just was mentally kind of thinking through what these design principles would look like. And I mean, they could be interesting. And and I think it it's it is a meaty discussion and i think we all have enough experience that if we do it in a work session it's going to be at least probably two hours after a regular meeting and uh it's you know i don't want to shortchange that discussion and i don't I, I want people to be fresh and thoughtful and excited to have the discussion and so i i think if i were to make a recommendation it may just be that the three of us that that we do it through the operations committee first um, because I think that we might have more time, space, and flexibility to, to have that discussion. And, but again, if, if the other four are like, no, we want to be involved, then I think we are just going to have to respect that. And maybe we can special schedule a special work session or, or something earlier so that we have plenty of time. And Matt, can you remind me, the fourth portrait of a graduate meeting is the end of May. How soon can we expect to get a summary or wrap up from that work? I think we'll be really, I mean, very quickly. Um, you know, just as we're already narrowing down these competencies, I can't imagine by the fourth uh, meeting, there's gonna be a big variance in that. I would say it'd be putting finishing touches on our design and, um, you know, some of maybe the ancillary components that go along with it. But I think we'd be pretty, uh, pretty well narrowed into what those um, attributes that we're gonna include in a portrait are gonna be. Perfect. Yeah. So I, I, if we'll have the portrait of a graduate work wrapped up before June, I think all seven of us will be able to digest that. Right. Other things you want to make sure that we cover or at least put in our thinking for the work session at the end of the month? At some point, do we, and this is actually a genuine question on my part, and I realize I don't often ask genuine questions. Uh, <laughs> do we need to consider the limitations on program funding or operational funding that, re, that have been imposed by the state on us as we consider these, uh, these uh, building and uh, um, instructional issues? Is that something that has an explicit uh, um, element to it? Or is it something that I can go ahead and do my dreaming and wishing and thinking this should happen uh, and not? Uh, what kind of limitations uh, are you talking about earlier? Like, what are you worried well, about for restrictions? Well, you know, we, we to me, it's pretty clear that the, that the state of Iowa is going to spend maybe 2% more a year on public school education, K through 12 education 
than it has for the last 25,000 years uh, for the indefinite future. So again, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that's an element that, <clears throat> that we need to address as we present these ideas to, uh, to the community. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I don't know, I guess the angle, I'm going to take this and I'd see if Chase or Les has a different angle to take it, but I think some of the funding uncertainty from the state is a little bit separated from some of our facility conversation. The, you know, the, the portrait and the programming work that comes from that is definitely probably more closely linked to what we can do from a programming aspect, because that's staff heavy, right? And that's where most of our budget goes. On some of these other facility components and operational pieces, I think we're on relatively more safe ground because it's more consistent, it's more predictable. It hasn't necessarily been underfunded or taken away, but the, the part that goes to our staff and being able to equip the buildings and offer the programming we want to, that's the part that's maybe uh, something we're gonna have to be um, cognizant of and know how can, we, how can we strategize this out knowing that we can't count on additional funding from the state. And so when we get to some of those programming aspects, that's where we could get into a little bit more difficult conversation around is there something we've traditionally done that we're no longer going to do because we believe this is more important and this is the right work to do uh, because we may not be able to sustain both in that sense. So that's my first blush, you know, honest reaction to it, Charlie, but I don't think it should prevent us from um, some of the, the facility projects may, we may want to do, but it definitely will inform some of the programming aspects as we consider those in those. And I know it's not as easy to separate those, you know, to totally say they're separate because obviously we're going to do the programming in the buildings we build or in the spaces that we create in those facilities. Okay, thanks. Chase, anything different? No, I agree with that. I, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it needs to be in the back of our minds, but I don't think we need to take that out to the community. It might, depending on, you know, I mean, it's hard to kind of talk to abstract, but let's say, you know, we. You mentioned early childhood. I know we've had that conversation a lot. And so we decide that there's going to be an early childhood focus. We could still embrace that as a district and use that as a guiding principle and start making facility upgrades based on that. But the scope or how big of that is, that's what's going to be, as Matt was saying, that's what we would have influenced by what our operational budget is. And so we wouldn't say, well, we can't do early childhood because of the operational um, financing we get from the state we would just have to be very cognizant of what that looks like as we would stagger that over the next several years or what the scope of that, of, of the scope of that would be. So yes, there's an influence on it, Charlie, but I agree with Matt. I don't think it's something we have to go out and um, put front and center in front of the community and say, hey, remember, no matter what you do, we've got we've to work with this over here. It's something that Dwayne for planning purposes and less for planning purposes will need to be conscious of um, behind the scenes. Lisa, that's what, I mean, that's what, you know, we were kind of looking for some consensus that maybe we were on the right path, that this was okay, uh, approach, um, and we'll continue to try to refine it and have even a better blueprint by the time we share it with the board at the end of the month. Perfect. I think um, that I, I it it's at least seems like you guys are right on track for me, and I didn't hear too much different from Charlie or Janet, but I'll let them chime in, chime in now. It's good to me. Thank you, Chase and Dwayne and Jeff. Thanks. No, I think this is a, a an excellent uh, way of uh, going ahead with it. Um, <clears throat> I feel sorry for you about having to, uh, to organize two or three or four public input sessions this summer, but I'm sure you can do that. So. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that either, but we'll 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 get it figured out. And we have to go too. Right. <laughs> have to be there. Or I have yeah, to stay I was going to say, Charlie, don't feel bad for Chase. <laughs> right. Sorry. I have to stay here in my room <laughs> in front of my computer. Well, right. and, and we're kidding around a little bit, which I always appreciate. We can be lighthearted, but that is one of the things we, we are still debating and trying to figure out is who we're going to get to facilitate the, the community engagement sessions. And so, um, 
we that is there are some of those logistical pieces that hopefully we'll have more detail on by the end of the month as well but that's one of those questions about do we facilitate it internally do we do we contact somebody externally to do that to help us move through the process and um yes feel less sorry for me if we get somebody externally to do it um but what did we do it last time when we did those big in input sessions we use sam from bldd um to help to help do that um and sam, sam johnson is his name and you know, I think that's one of the beauties of Portrait of a Graduate, right? Colin is from outside the district, and so he's very objective, and so, um, or has it, people see it as a very objective lens because he doesn't have any skin in the game. And so there is something to be said for that. It's just finding a person and, and kind of getting them tuned up for where we want them to be and how we want them to make the, the, the process flow. But it's something we can still try to track down here in the next few weeks. So before we go, um, and I, I'd like to give everybody five minutes to transition to the next meeting. Um, I skipped over approving the minutes um, at the beginning of the meeting because I wanted to make sure we had enough time to, to talk. But I wonder if we could circle back. Um, Janet, we deferred approving the February min meeting minutes last month um, since it was just Charlie and I. So we deferred it to this month. Um, if we could maybe get a motion uh, and a second to approve those minutes that are on the board docs agenda. I would move that the minutes for the last two minutes be approved, meetings be approved. Second. All right, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And then our next operations committee meeting is set for May 4th at 4 p.m. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor. Hi. Right. Thanks. All right. See you soon, some of you. <laughs> Bye.